Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Carol Johnson, and I'll be leading today's service. Reverend Matt Alsbaugh will be presenting our message this morning. Our opening words this morning are by Reverend Dan Lambert, Unitarian Universalist minister. You are welcome here, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter what your background. You're welcome here to join us as we proclaim worth in our spiritual journeys. You're welcome to join us as we sing songs that uplift our very beings. You're welcome to join us in community as we learn, live, and love together. All are welcome as we worship that which gives us each meaning and value. No matter what you call this building, this hour, or this gathering of people, we worship as one body illuminated by the light of the chalice. And so now I just want to welcome you with live from Fellowship Hall. It's our LCUUF Sunday service. Yay. Our announcements were on a slideshow before the service. If you didn't see them, don't worry. They were sent out by email yesterday with the order of service for today. A few notes. Our building is now open to all for in-person services. We continue to offer our service on Zoom each Sunday for those who are unable to attend in person. Wearing masks in the fellowship building is now encouraged but not required. And now a special welcome to our visitors. If you're visiting us for the first time or have returned or reconnected with us after a long absence, we invite you to say your name and tell us where you're from. If you're on Zoom, use the Zoom raise hand feature or just turn on your video and wave your hand and we'll ask you to unmute. If you're in the room, just raise your hand. Anybody new with us? <laughs> Rehearsal. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kathy Vardy, and we're from Houston. We're visiting Lakeside for three months. Welcome. Yeah. I'm John. I'm Kathy's better okay. half. <laughs> yes. okay. Good morning. I'm Amanda Painter, and I moved from Alaska about three years ago to uh, Centro Chapala. Oh. Welcome. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right, great. Now let's switch to those on Zoom. Is there anyone new with us on Zoom? I don't think so. I think we're all old timers. Uh, okay, <laughs> very good. Okay. If you have a chalice at home, you might want to place it nearby. Our chalice lighting words today are offered by Daniel Faria, the Alliance of Portuguese Speaking Unitarian Universalists but it's not in Portuguese. <laughs> we light this chalice as a symbol of faith, hope, and love. To face the shadows, a chalice of light. To face inequity, a chalice of justice. To face falsehood, a chalice of truth. To face evil, a chalice of goodness. To face disharmony, a chalice of beauty. May your brightness, manifestation of the infinite light, Bless our hearts, our spirits, and our lives. Ahora en español. Encendemos este cáliz como símbolo de fe, esperanza y amor para enfrentar las sombras un cáliz de luz, para enfrentar la inequidad un cáliz de justicia, para enfrentar la falsedad un cáliz de verdad, para enfrentar la maldad un cáliz de bondad, para enfrentar la discordia, un cáliz de hermosura. Que tu brillo, manifestación de la luz infinita, bendiga nuestros corazones, nuestros espíritus y nuestras vidas. Now let us light our chalices with these words which we sing together. hymn this morning is Enter, Rejoice, and Come In. Please rise as you're willing and able and join us in singing. Enter, rejoice, and come in. 
rejoice and come in. And to rejoice and come in. week, we take time to remind ourselves that we belong to a community that cares for each other. We do this by sharing any significant joys or sorrows in our lives. If you have a joy or sorrow to share today, you can type it into the chat now and we'll read those aloud. First, let us recall the joys. Whatever you may be celebrating, whatever evokes a feeling of joy or peace for yourself or others. You on Zoom are welcome to type joys into the chat box, and we'll, we'll start with the folks here. Are there any joys that people would like to share here in the room? My concern from last week has turned into a joy this week. Our son um, had successful surgery to remove a brain tumor and he's recovering nicely and hopefully will be coming home to recuperate tomorrow. Carrie and I are joyful in joining the fellowship this morning. Do we have any joys on Zoom? Oh, yes, we do. We have two. Uh, the first is Larry and Dee Dee are back in New England after a lovely trip to Paris and river cruise from Budapest to Amsterdam. It was a wonderful excursion and they hope to be in Mexico in a few weeks. And another joy, and this is from Colleen, my daughter, Mary Ann, and her boyfriend, Nick, arrived yesterday, and we are happily visiting together. They love Ahihi. That's it? That's okay. it for our joys. Very good. Now let us voice our sorrows or concerns. Whatever you or the world may be holding that is in need of our healing and caring thoughts, you're welcome to type sorrows and concerns in the chat box. Again, we'll start with the folks here in the room. Are there any sorrows in the room? I have two this morning. Uh, one is an ongoing uh, difficulty in my family. My sister, who uh, we are estranged, but she lives here, and she has been admitted to the hospital and then asked to leave because she tested co positive for COVID <laughs> once again, her third time. And um, it's a very rough life she's living. The second one is I want to say that all of us want to give support uh, to Susie Lindemann, who's going through a very deep, deep loss. She's fine physically and everything, but she's had a deep, deep loss. And I just want her to know we're here. I think you might be on Zoom, Susie. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Okay. 
All right. Are there any sorrows to be shared on Zoom? Unfortunately, yes, we have several. The first, uh, would you please light Hello. a candle of sorrow for Susie Lindemann? Rudy, are you there? Oh. Yes. yes. All right. I guess we'll think. Oh, wait. No, no, there no. Are no sorrows out in uh, Zoom land. You can't Zoom. hear me? And this uh, candle. Oh, oh, yes? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, we have several sorrows. The first is for Susie Lindemann, whose best friend ever, who also was a male, died July 3rd in New Mexico. We think of a heart attack. Susie shares that they were novios for 32 years. Novios. Our next concern is for Ellen, uh, from Ellen for her grandson, Nick. Nick's facing a third surgery on his leg, this time with a large skin graft to help his wound heal. And from me, a concern for Cheryl Swain, who hurried home from her European vacation to be with her sister as her sister enters her final days. Unexpectedly final. And finally, would you light a candle of concern from Liz Mulder for the families of the victims, as well as, as the surviving victims in the mass shootings in the US and Canada. While the US probably holds the world's record for non-war mass shootings, Canada has been struggling with gun safety issues for many years and increase, increasingly so. And I think that is the end of our sorrows. Very good. Oh, hi. Wait a sec, we need a, you need a microphone. Here we go. Um, hello, I'm new here, but um, I understand my mother who I never met passed this week. And, and welcome to you for being new here. Yes. <clears throat> And this candle from our care team <clears throat> represents those sorrows that are too raw, too difficult for us to share aloud. So many of us have had losses, partners, children, grandchildren, pets, losses that remain present with us every day. So many of us have had burdens, anger, fear, and frustration, all of those things that weigh heavy on our hearts. We light this candle for all those unspoken sorrows. All right, now we'd like to welcome Paula Odom up to our, the front to, for our new member celebration. Yes, okay. Well, today we honor our newest members and also those that have joined since COVID. Um, it's been a you know, difficult and challenging two years and for many folks, probably about eight or 10, actually came to my house to sign the book. And that was really nice because it was a small group and all that. And then we've had people join during lockdown and some got to have a ceremony, some didn't, and it was just all confusing. So first of all, those that will sign the book today for the first time, June and Terry and Pearl, if you'd come forward. And then also, uh, come up. Yes, you have to introduce yourselves. And then also those in the last two years during COVID, if you have joined, that would be wonderful. Just so we can, the whole congregation and those on Zoom can see how much we've grown, how the community is, even during lockdown and COVID. And this isn't everyone. Uh, but thank you for making the effort to come today. And what we're going to do is just pass the microphone and ask you to introduce yourself, uh, where you're from, and how long you've lived in Ahihik. And I, I just really want to point out, we've had a couple of people, or a few people join, not just a couple, that have really stepped up since joining. 
We've got our new president, people on the service committee, you know, service leaders, pres presenters, and you know, it's just wonderful that we have the growth and new ideas. And and thank you very much. So, Matt, I just okay. passed the. Okay. I do not mind. I'm uh, Kathleen Ferris. I'm from Central Louisiana originally, and I've lived here in the area, in Ahihik and now in San Antonio. Uh, for almost five years. My five-year anniversary will be at the end of October, and I love it, and I love the UUs. <laughs> I'm Tom McClure, and I'm from Kentucky, and I've been in and out of the area for about uh, seven or eight years, and uh, this is uh, my first time of joining Unitarian Universalist. I've attended many, many places, but it's very nice to be here. Thank you. And Tom was one that came to the house to sign the book. Thank you. <laughs> Along with Richie, Richard and uh, Ricky Kruger, but who aren't here today. So. Hello, my name is Garrett Browning. I'm basically from Northern California. Uh, I've lived here in uh, Mirasol for five years. And attended off and on and joined recently. Well, my name is Pearl Schooler Glenn, and um, uh, Terry and I, um, well, have been here since April 13th. And um, let's see, I'm originally from California. More recently, we're um, um, also in Florida. <coughs> Won't say anything else about that, <laughs> and um, we're very happy to be joining the fellowship today. And um, in a few weeks, we have to go back, and and that saddens us. But we are happy today to be here. Welcome. I'm I'm Terry Glenn, and um, I'm delighted to be here since April of this year, and. Um, we are, I am originally from South Florida, Miami, Florida, and delighted to go back and enjoy some of what we have there, some of the beauty and neat things there. And I have never been a member of a Unitarian church. I have been a friend of a Unitarian church. So this is a, a great um, moment for me to be a member. I'm June Wilson. Um, I've been coming for summers. We came for many years and a year ago, a little over a year ago, we moved here permanently. Um, and um, I'm happy to be here. I was in search of a spiritual home, and I found one here. Hi, I'm Devorah Kelly. This Tuesday marks one year that I've been here. Um, I'm from New Hampshire. I was a longtime UU at the church in Keene, New Hampshire, and also for four years in the one in Portland, Maine. So. Um, I was thrilled because I was coming here anyway, so I was thrilled to find out there's actually a UU church um, right here in Lakeside. So it just was like the frosting on the cake. Hi, I'm Barley Donahue, originally from Minnesota, and I was, uh, grew up in uh, the Universalist church there until they joined the Unitarians. And it was amazing to move here and find a UU, so I'm happy. Uh, I'm Chris Gang. Uh, this will be the fourth ju Unitarian Church I've been a member of, going member of, going back to my youth, um, mostly because of moves, not because they threw me out. <laughs> uh, as she mentioned, I am also uh, current board president, so uh, it's uh, easy to get involved here. <laughs> uh, and, and Deb and I are originally from Ohio, but we have been here permanently. Will be three years in about a week, about two, three weeks. I'm Deb Gang, and I'm with him. He's. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been a Unitarian for over 40 years. Well, since I met that guy, <laughs> so glad to have found a, a community here. I'm Suzanne Bjorner. Um, Johannes and I have been going, uh, coming to. Lakeside for about six or seven years now, uh, off and on. And this past January, we started spending at least half of the year here. 
and that's when we actually joined the fellowship here. We're really happy to have this, uh, this community here. It makes a huge difference. It's the second Unitarian community that I've been a part of. I'm Johannes Piona, and um, as Susanna says, we have been coming here for a long time. We're very happy to be here, and I want to say we had a wonderful orientation yesterday where we learned about the past of the church, um, and also the welcoming, saying the welcoming new members with new ideas, different way of doing things, which shows how open-minded the church is. I'm Jane Castleman. My husband and I joined about a year ago. Um, it was a real amazing thing to see how something was asked of you as well. I feel like I joined, I joined something really special. Thank you. Thank you. So, Chris, I'll give you the microphone. Oh, sorry. Oh, yay, Annie. Hi, I'm Annie. Hello. I'm Annie Morris. I joined during the pandemic, and I've been up there, but Matt is so help welcoming. He said, go up again. I love this place. It's got such a wonderful energy. Thank you for letting me be a member. Good morning. It's a joy to welcome each of you to our community of memory and hope. We'll walk together with, will you walk together with us, sharing the joys and responsibilities of membership? If you will, say yes. 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 Members of Lake Chapala Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, will you welcome these people into our congregation? Will you reach out to them in friendship, including them in our activities and fellowship? Will you be open to their unique gifts and perspectives? Will you extend a warm welcome to each of them, remembering that each of us was once a new member? Yes. Yes. yes, we join our strengths, talents, and commitment with yours. You are part of us, and we are part of you. Becoming a member of this church is an important step, but it's only the first step. I charge you, with new, members, I charge you new members to grow in your faith. More importantly, I charge you to find and share your special gifts with us. Ours is a shared ministry. Each of us has a crucial role to play. We need you. We need ideas. Give generously of yourselves and your rewards will be great. You, sign, you signed or will sign the membership book as a tangible symbol of your membership. Please accept our gift of a rose symbolizing our faith that you will fully bloom into the new fellowship home. Welcome to the Lake Chapala Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. Matt would have been part of the welcome, but I read through his part. My apologies. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. And uh, I'm going to give um, uh, Chris a chance to get back up there uh, to uh, run the cameras. You might have to do a little bit of uh, playing around there. And then uh, we'll go into a kind of a meditation. And I say this is a kind of a meditation because um, for some of you hardcore meditators, you might think this is not meditating at all. <laughs> but this is actually something I learned very recently, um, uh, a tool that actually may be helpful for um, many of us, um, especially when we're having a situation where we are just too agitated, too amped up to do anything like meditation, you know, like traditional, I'm sorry, traditional meditation. Um, and so 
Uh, it's another technique that you could use to help quiet your mind, um, perhaps in preparation for meditation or perhaps just simply to quiet your mind. Um, and it's a technique uh, called counting colors. And so quite simply, all I invite you to do is to just sit quietly and look around. There's no contest here or anything like that, but notice everything, kind of count off everything that you see of a particular color, like red. And then when you run out of red things, pick another color and count everything you see there. So just, let's just take a couple minutes and while you do that, again, this is no contest. We're not going to ask anybody to count and say their numbers or anything like Just use your time to look around, notice the colors, count them off. One, two. And let us return to this time and space to be together again. This, excuse me, this is the time in our service when we ask that you remember that we share our gifts here through pledging and donations. Instructions for payments to the fellowship are on a slide during the announcements before the service every week. For people here at the fellowship, we'll pass a basket. And while you're considering your gifts to the fellowship, remember that each month, LCUUF donates 5,000 pesos or more to an organization in our lakeside community. We share one half of the offering collected at the fellowship each week with that organization. For the month of July, we're supporting Operation Feed in San Juan Cosala. For over 30 years, Operation Feed volunteers have been providing food and improving the lives of the very poor and marginalized people in the village of San Juan Cosala. They provide weekly food dispenses to 150 families and individuals who would go hungry without the aid. Many of the recipients are elderly, disabled, and children. Operation Feed also supports new program initiatives like cooking classes and crochet projects to involve the people in developing additional income sources and skills, thereby offering them a hand up, not just a hand out. Operation Feed's goal is to help these people live productive lives free from hunger. If you're not attending the fellowship in person, please donate to share the basket when you pay your pledge. Donate to Share the Basket separately or indicate what part of your donation is for Share the Basket. The offering will be now be given and gratefully received.
Now, this short video is by one of the people who work at the Faithful Fools Ministry in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, California. Hi, I'm Sam Dennison, and I'm going to take you on a little walk into my neighborhood, into the Tenderloin. It's a place where many guidebooks and many residents of San Francisco will tell you you shouldn't go and it's certainly you shouldn't go alone. It's a kind of dicey neighborhood known as much for its vibrancy as it is for violence. It's seen as a dangerous place. Here at the corner of Turk and Hyde, you can see my building, the purple one in the middle. I live there and I work there. In some ways, this is an incredibly creative neighborhood and it's incredibly ordinary in some ways. We have lots of children who live here, many families. We have people living here from all over the world and in all walks of life and all kinds of occupations. We are also an extraordinary neighborhood. We have more than a third of our neighbors live in poverty. Almost half the people who live on the streets of San Francisco live on these streets. And if I have the numbers right, I suspect we have more than half the intravenous drug users of San Francisco living nearby. We suffer the consequences of poverty more than other neighborhoods as well. We die younger, more often on the streets, more violently. That's why we really have to change our culture. It's not enough just to do something differently. We have to kind of change who we are and how we are together. We can't expect the police to solve our problems. We need to be citizens together here in this neighborhood. We need to form welcoming forces so when people are coming back from prison or from programs, they don't fall into the same behaviors, that they have a chance to stay clean if that's what they want to do. We also have to make it, I don't know, somehow less hazardous to live on the streets. I'm not sure that we will ever really be able to get many more people off the streets until there's more housing. And until there's more housing, we have to make it safer on the streets. That means being safe from the cold and from hunger and from violence. The violence that comes from outside of the neighborhood and the violence within the neighborhood, the violence that comes with police enforcement. And I'll tell you, it's a good thing none of us have to do this work alone. Lots of us are doing this work from many different angles in many different parts of the community, and that's a good thing. So there you have it. That's a little glimpse into my neighborhood and a little peek at my dreams. Thank you. The title of this sermon uh, comes from the movie The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith and his son, Jaden Smith. This movie came out in uh, 2006. Some of you might remember it. Uh, this, film, this film is a biopic about Chris Gardner, who completely broke, ends up living on the streets, and occasionally in subway bathrooms in the BART with his young son. He's uh, able to score an unpaid internship position at this stock brokerage which promises to hire just one of the 20 interns at the end of this six month internship. And during this whole time, Gardner hides the fact that he's living on the street. He develops some innovative sales techniques at this um, internship and he ultimately wins the paying job and his way off of the streets. I have a very tenuous connection with this film. Let me tell you about that. When I was at Star King School for the Ministry in Berkeley, uh, in California, one of the workshops I took was a Saturday program all day on homelessness offered by a group affiliated with the school, the Faithful Fools. This program was not merely a classroom session on homelessness. We were asked to try out being homeless for just a few hours. For this street retreat, as they called it, we were told to come to the Unitarian Universalist Society of San Francisco that morning. 
I went with a healthy degree of trepidation. What was I getting into? Is this even going to be safe? We left our belongings, our phones, our money, everything at the UU Society. We were given a map with some directions to various soup kitchens in the city in the Tinderalorn area and to told to just go out and spend the day as if this was our life. Go find out what it's like just to hang out on the streets with no place to go, nothing to do. I tried to pass the time walking around, hanging out in a park and talking to other people living on the streets. Some people were happy to talk to me and I learned a little bit about their lives, a little bit about the situations that put them on the street in the first place. When it was lunchtime, I reluctantly went to a soup kitchen and got in line. It was frankly disturbing to be on the receiving side of the serving line. I felt I was doing something wrong. I was in fact stealing, in fact, the food that was intended for other people. But I was also hungry and I ate and I talked to other people at my table. By then I'd figured out that when you saw a line, you got into it even if you didn't know what the line was for. One line was for handing out loaves of bread, ordinary white wonder bread. I didn't need a loaf of bread, but I was glad to see that the bread was there for other people. At Glide Memorial Church, this huge Methodist church, I got in another line. And after following it up some stairs and through an annex, I learned that this line was for extras for a movie that would be made seen soon. I learned that the producers of The Pursuit of Happiness wanted to cast actual real people who lived on the streets as extras rather than use professional actors. Now they planned to pay the extras fairly at equity rates and so they knew they'd get many people interested. So to make sure they got the most reliable ones, they had these casting calls at various times in the tenderloin. To be selected, you had to first show up for these casting calls. So at the end of the day, while some of the people I'd encountered were heading off to line up for beds and shelters, I headed back to the UU Society where the other retreatants and I shared our experiences and reflections from the day. It was humbling for me to realize our commonality as people, all of us, and that but for good luck in life, in my life, I could have easily ended up living on the streets. Faithful Fools, which sponsored this, these street retreats, was founded by a UU minister and a Catholic nun. It is primarily a ministry of presence. They don't run a shelter or a feeding program. And while they do offer some programs like a trauma ministry for people without homes and advocate for their needs, their main focus is educating people like me in the realities of living on the streets. And if I'd wanted to, I could have taken one of their more advanced programs, living for a week or even a whole semester in the community of the streets. A classmate of mine at the seminary did this, and he went on to work for the Faithful Fools and later on did community and ju social justice ministry. Some months after my street retreat, I visited Glide Memorial Church on a Sunday. It was an amazing service for this church really focuses on social justice work in the Tenderloin neighborhood around it. At coffee hour, I had a chance to talk with the minister, Reverend Cecil Williams, and I asked him about the movie. He knew all about it, for Chris Gardner was one of the people the church had helped out and who was now an active member and financial supporter of the church. By the way, I'll say, in researching this, I found out that the Methodist church denomination had a disagreement with this church for being too liberal and kicked them out. Yeah. In being on the streets, among the community of the streets, with the ministry of the faithful fools, I began to realize how hard good social justice work can be. It's multidimensional. It's multifaceted, but at the core, it often comes down to developing a deep connection with the people you're trying to help to serve or to advocate for. In doing social justice work, it's often good to just see ourselves as extras. For the real players are the people we are helping. It's their script, 
not ours. This, this next video is by Lori Santos, a professor of pro positive psychology at Yale University. She teaches a very highly acclaimed and very popular course on happiness. So when we think of college life, we often think of images that look like this. We think of a generally happy time. But sadly, as a head of college on Yale's campus, that's not always what I see. What I see firsthand is the growing college mental health crisis that we see on our college campuses today. Thankfully for Yale, it's not just Yale. Um, sadly, this is something that we see across the nation. Here are the national statistics that we see. According to a national college health survey, over 40% of our college students report regularly being too depressed to function. Over 60% say they're overwhelmingly anxious, and another 60% report feeling very lonely most of the time. So I see these statistics as a professor and a head of college, and I think these are really awful. But they also beg a really important question, and that question is, what is going on? Why are our young people so unhappy? There's lots of things going on, but today I want to suggest a slightly surprising answer that comes from the science of psychology. And that answer is that there might be a problem with our minds. It might be that our minds are actually lying to us about the kinds of things that make us happy. Simply put, we're seeking out the wrong kinds of stuff. Here's one wrong thing that some of us are seeking out, case of money. We're at the World Economic Forum, so a lot of us think that if we just <laughs> got more of this stuff, we'd be happy. But is that really true? That's what researchers Danny Kahneman and Angus Deaton tried to look at. They collected a whole set of measures about people's happiness and well-being and tried to see if those measures were correlated with people's annual salary, at least in the US. Here's what they found, plotted logarithmically. They find that happiness does go up as salary goes up, but that going up stops off at a point. And that point is around 75K. What does that mean? That means if you are in 75K, if I double or even triple your salary, it's not gonna have any impact on your well-being. It's not what we forecast, but it's what the data suggests. This is just one of a number of cases where it seems like our minds are lying to us. It's, our minds are causing us to seek out stuff we think is gonna make us happy, but it's not going to work. And I think this is part of the crisis that we see in our young people and just in everybody today. We're seeking out all kinds of things that we expect to give us this boost in well-being, but it's not working. And we might be seeking those things out at the expense of the things that really do matter. But then that raises the question, what matters? Like, what aren't we doing that we should be doing? And here's where there's lots of good news. The good news is that we don't have to listen to our lying minds because we have science, the power of everything we love. We have two decades of work that tells us some counterintuitive things we really should be paying attention to to improve our well-being. One of those counterintuitive things is the fact that we should be seeking out more social connection. What's the thing that separates very happy people from not so happy people? The amount of time that they spend with people they care about. But it's not just people you care about. It turns out that very short interactions with a stranger can improve our mood more than we expect. Here's one lovely study that looked at this. This is by Nick Epley and his colleagues. He goes up to folks that are commuting on the train, on the L train in Chicago, and he says, you're gonna be in one of two different study conditions. Either you're gonna be in the solitude condition, which means you're gonna ride this train and just enjoy your solitude, or you're gonna be in the social condition. You have to ride this train, and for the whole train ride, you have to talk to somebody and make a connection. <laughs> So you're laughing, you're predicting what most subjects predict. Like that is gonna be weird, right? And that's when he asks subjects what subjects predict. They predict the solitude condition is gonna feel good, social condition feels bad. But what really happens when you run this study is exactly the opposite. In fact, it's the solitude condition that sucks. The social condition feels really good. We mistakenly seek solitude when being social would make us happier. But that's not the only domain where we mess up. A second domain where we mess up is we mistakenly don't take opportunities to do nice things for others. Another thing that separates very happy people, they give more to charity at every income level, and they volunteer, spend time helping others. But we know this not just from demographics, we also know this from the empirical data. Here's another study by social psychologist Liz Dunn. She tries to get people to do nice things for others. She walks up to people on the street, hands them $20, and says, by the end of the day, you have to spend this. You either have to spend it on yourself, you treat yourself to something nice, or you should spend it on somebody else. The question is, if you were in this study, what would make you happier? If you were like most subjects, you might think that treating yourself feels good. After all, you're going to get something out of this, right? And that's what Liz Dunn finds. When she actually surveys how people predict they're going to feel, people predict that spending the money on yourself is going to feel better. 
But what really happens is just the opposite. Both when I survey you at the end of the day and even at the end of the week, you feel better if you spent that money on somebody else. We mistakenly try to treat ourselves, spend our money on ourselves, when helping others would feel better. One of the reasons that money doesn't make us as happy as we think. All this goes to say that there are a bunch of ways that our minds are lying to us. They cause us to go after this stuff that we think is going to work, but it doesn't work. And we do that at the expense of behaviors that really would improve our well-being if we did them. What does this mean? It means that I think we could solve our college mental health crisis if students were taught to go after some of the right kinds of stuff. But it's not just for our college students. All of us can improve our happiness if we did it the right way. And that's the good news. The science of psychology suggests ways that each one of you in this room could improve your well-being. You just have to take a little bit more of a scientific approach. Thank you. When I'm preparing a sermon, I love it when I find a reading, or these days a, a video clip, that sums up the essence of what I'm going to say. Sometimes we find s something that's so good that if you choose to tune me out, maybe get a cup of coffee or go to the bathroom, and that's all OK, you still have something to take away. This video by Lori Santos is a bit like that. Now, happiness is an elusive quality. It's one of those things like romance or success or even nirvana, or for that matter, sleep, that you just cannot will into being. You can't say, I'm going to be happy now, any more than you can say, I'm going to have some of that nirvana now. <laughs> or for some of us, it's simply, I'm just going to go right to sleep for a solid eight this instant. <laughs> Yet we're learning, yes, we're doing that science stuff, a few things about happiness. Santos already commented that our brain lies to us, it tricks us about the things that might make us happy. And one of her key examples is money. The research by psychologist Daniel Kahneman and economist Angus Deaton that she mentioned, that research about 10 years ago, that happiness due to income kind of tops out at about $75,000 a year US was quite surprising as it goes against our Western cultural belief that wealth directly correlates with happiness. Santos notes that she gets a lot of pushback from her students on this topic. They have more than ever bought into this belief. She notes also that there is a recent paper that shows that happiness continues to increase as income continues to increase somewhat. It's lauded by conservatives. But she says, look at the data. It's like if you change your income from $100,000 a year to $600,000, your happiness goes from like 64 out of 100 to a 65. For the amount of work you have to put in to sextuple your income, she says you could st instead just write in a gratitude journal or, or you could sleep in an extra hour to get the same result. Matt here, I think I'll just sleep in. But it may not just be about the money. Arthur Brooks notes that many people would rather be special than happy. He speaks from personal experience. He said, I once found myself confessing to a close friend, I would prefer to be special than happy. And the friend asked why. I said, well, anyone can do things that takes to be happy, going on vacation with family, relaxing with friends, but not everyone can accomplish great things. What Brooks learned with age is that the specialness treadmill is brutal work, and it never ends. He notes that in his time heading a think tank in Washington, DC, he encountered many prominent people in media and politics. And when they stepped out of the spotlight, either voluntarily or involuntarily, they suffered mightily. Additionally, there's that little Buddhist idea of clinging or attachment. I know myself that when I'm having a really enjoyable experience, maybe a great vacation or a fantastic meal, I wonder, how can I make this last? 
I've learned at least with the meal, it does no good to order more food. <laughs> Nor does it often work to go back to the same restaurant next week and try to recreate that gastronomic experience. Happiness is often fleeting. Now, also, some people believe that happiness leads to complacency. This can be a special trap for social justice people. I mean, I'm sure you've heard the line, if you're not outraged, or maybe it's overwhelmed or depressed, then you're not paying attention. And yes, the world is really messed up right now, but we can still have our moments of happiness. And to think otherwise is the classic Protestant work ethic trap, mind trap. And it's not true. Santos points to work by a positive psychologist, Kostadin Kushlev, who indicates that people who have high positive emotions tend to be the ones who are out taking action, doing the work. And that's been my experience too. I vividly recall studying with a labor organizer. I think she was with uh, Service Employees um, uh, Union. And, and like most in the labor move movement in the United States, uh, she had had far more losses than wins in the last few years. And yet she had a positive, joyous, funny, happy outlook, even about the losses. And I think that helped her to be able to go back into the battle. Now, obviously, avoiding many of these things, the, the things that uh, where our minds are lying to us, focusing on money, on being special, on clinging to things, these can help us become happier, avoiding them. But additionally, Santos's video listed several positive things that we can do to enhance happiness. We can be generous with our money and our time. We can spend time with other people, both people we care about as well as strangers. And we can also do this. We can be religious. Santos notes, I quote, there's a lot of evidence that religious people, for example, are happier with a sense of life satisfaction and positive emotion in the moment. But it's more subtle than just being religious. Santos goes on. But is it the Christian who really believes in Jesus and reads the Bible? Or is it the Christian who goes to church, goes to the spaghetti suppers, donates to charity, participates in the volunteer stuff. Turns out, to the extent that you can disentangle these two, it seems to not be our beliefs, but our actions that are driving the fact that religious people are happier. And this is, I think, one of the things that we do well here at LCUUF. We're not very much hung up on doctrine or belief. Instead, we're more about community, about connections, about what we can do to help each other in our community and the world. And in the pursuit of happiness, those are the things that really matter. Blessed be. Our closing hymn is to, Tis a Gift to be Simple. Please rise and join us in singing.
Our closing words are by UU Minister Reverend Barber, Barbara Cheatham. And now we take our leave. Before we gather here again, may each of us bring happiness into another's life. May each of us be surprised by the gifts that surround us. May each of us be enlivened by the constant curiosity. And may we remain together in spirit till the hour we meet again. Let us extinguish our chalices now with these words, which we read together. Words? <laughs> we extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we keep in our hearts and share with all the world. It's now on. Now, I know that in about 60 seconds, the bells are going to ring <laughs> over there. So I'm just going to say a few words before um, I play the, the, uh, the, the postlude. But what Matt said today really rang true with me because many years ago, well, way back in the 90s when I moved from England, I was very concerned about how my musical career was going. I had this kind of negative feeling about it. So my wife and I moved to Canada and I started reading two books, one of which was the Norman Vincent Peale book, The Power of Positive Thinking. And the other one was You Can Change Your Life by Louise Hay. Um, and at the same time, um, I started going to uh, a Unity Church in Vancouver, British Columbia. And that, like here, was a very positive experience, a very positive uh, fellowship, and it changed my life to the point where I started believing that I could do things and I could become happy, and through that I could make other people happy. And, uh, and that is how, through my career as a musician, I have approached my life's work. And I like to think that over the past 30 odd years or so, that all the musical performances that I've been in and been involved with has brought some form of happiness uh, to the audience and to the people that experience that and to the musicians. So from a personal point of view, it really does ring true to me. There we go. <laughs> yeah, bang on cue. <laughs> so, Ah, there we are, yes. I thought they'd forgotten. Um, so, when I wake up in the morning, I feel happy. I'm happy that I'm here. I'm, I'm happy that I'm here in the church. Um, I'm happy where I live. I'm, I'm just happy. And there's no point in being negative because it doesn't get you anywhere. But being happy, you feel so great. So, when I found out about the topic of today's uh, uh, service, I thought, well, we've got to have a happy song. <laughs> well, we did my favorite things, which is very happy. Uh, but I thought, well, what about Happy by Pharrell Williams from Despicable Me <laughs> 2? Now, I don't particularly care for animation, but this song is just uplifting. And so I want you to all participate. Now, I don't expect you to do any rap or hip-hop singing. Leave that to me. <laughs> but what I would like you to do is when I say clap, you're going to clap, you're going to smile, and you're going to smile at your neighbor, and you're going to make yourself and everybody else in this room happy. Will you do that? Yeah. Right. And the only reason I'm singing this is because some of you that were here about two or three weeks ago experienced my very first public singing. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. A few people came up and said, oh, you should do more of that. <laughs> my wife tried to tell me not to. <laughs> but anyway, 
Um, it's not going to be a regular thing, but you can't do this song unless you have the words. So here we go. What I'm about to say Sunshine, she's here, you can take a break I'm a hot air balloon that could go to space With the air like I don't care, baby, by the way Get ready Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth and smile. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Here come bad news, talking this and that. Yeah. Give me all you got, don't hold it back. I should probably warn you that I'll be okay. No offense to you, don't waste your time. Here's why. Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Clap along if you feel like happiness is the truth. Smile, clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel like that's what you want to do. Yeah, one more time. Clap along if you feel like a room without a roof. Clap along if you feel that happiness is the truth. Clap along if you know what happiness is to you. Clap along if you feel that's not what you want to do. 